pausing for like five to 10 seconds at a time, but it's fine. Cool. Uh, all right. And we are live. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. This is Robin Whoops. Jordan. <laughs> We're just doing a little technical uh, technical check here, but uh, hopefully everything is coming through okay. Uh, if anybody's having some technical issues, definitely let us know. But uh, we are back and we are at live number 38, I think. Is that right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Cool. Uh, so last week, we were very happy to have a handful of folks come in and participate in the chat and have some questions and have a little bit of interaction. Uh, and this week, we are going to maybe have a little bit of interaction as well, uh, but we want to go over some more questions that we get. So as uh, you may know, Archangel Inc. is a uh, publishing service provider, and we uh, help clients, help authors who are looking to publish either their first book or you know uh, their fifth or tenth book. And one of the responsibilities that we have taken is to be a resource for them. And so we'll come across a number of different questions and uh, things that, you know, maybe they haven't encountered before and they're trying to figure out. And so that is the inspiration for this video, kind of address some of that and uh, build in that learning library that uh, we are compiling with these live videos and uh, yeah, just assist in anybody else who might have similar questions. Did you have anything you wanted to start with as we get going here? No, I'll just add to that. Uh, this is fun for us. So definitely, yeah, just let us know if you have any more questions. Uh, it's kind of fun to answer a, a different mix because I think it's just good, uh, you know, because questions real people have and we've gotten these. And, you know, some, I think sometimes we mentioned this last week. Uh, one of the biggest things is you don't know what you don't know. So sometimes you don't know to even ask the question until you hear it and you're like, oh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna have that question or I'd love to know the answer to that. So that's why we really feel like this is valuable. So we encourage you if you're watching now or if you're watching in the future to uh, stick with us and check out some of these questions. Cool, yeah, absolutely great. Uh, great comments all around, but let's jump right in and we'll see uh, We'll see how far we can get. Uh, <laughs> interest of full disclosure, we are advertising 10, but uh, <laughs> we may have a couple of extras here as well. So we'll see. Uh, number one. Should I make my book available for free? What do you think, Jordan? Uh, is it is that a viable option these days? I think it's a good question because it's it's something that really it used to be the uh, the thing that you do. You like years ago, you know, if you were if you wanted to launch a book, you'd launch it for free, and then you'd be able to switch it over on Amazon to paid, and then your rankings would actually carry over from. Uh, the free rankings into the paid rankings. Now that that hasn't worked for years uh, now. So that's so doing it for that purpose is no longer a good reason. Now people still ask that, hey, is it still worth it to uh, offer my book up for free? And I think there are certainly some cases where this could be a good option. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my book, Book Launch Gladiator, up for free on Amazon. I've had it for free since I since I posted it. For me, it was uh, it's a shorter book. It's still around the 20,000 word range and it has some good value in it. Uh, but I want to just use it to get people interested in, in me and to market myself a little bit. I didn't write that book with a plan to make a ton from that book. I just wanted to bring people in. Now you can certainly still do that with paid books and we suggest that. Uh, but for me at that time, it was like, hey, you know, I'm just going to offer this as a free resource for people. Not just out of the goodness of my heart. Uh, it was that too. But just because hey, I wanted to... I wanted the barrier to entry to be really low just for people to get to know me. And I think that can still be a good option for people. It's it's less and less a good option. And I think right now you definitely would, you know, doing it today, you might want to consider all the avenues. Um, but it's still it's still a potential option. It just really does depend on the, the situation. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I want to mention we have got Jim in the audience. Thanks for joining us again, Jim. If you have questions along the way, we are happy to answer as best we can, but thanks for tuning in. So uh, yes, several years ago when we first started, when Archangel Inc. first started, the guy I was partnering with to uh, build the company, uh, we found basically that you put your book available on Amazon for free. And like you mentioned, Jordan, it translates over pretty seamlessly into the paid market and you could basically guarantee more or less um, a decent return on it after a short while. And so we did, we recommended for it, recommended that for everybody because we thought, well, if it's going to increase uh, overall sales, then sure, we can, we can uh, sacrifice a handful of sales at the beginning. But these days I, I'm more inclined to, to zag a little bit, whereas I think that is an option making it available for free. I think it is also really important to 
value your work appropriately as an author to increase that perception of value. And at the time, maybe there was less of a uh, less of a market with uh, with free books, and so you can kind of stand out there. Free books actually got read, whereas now I think I mean I know personally I have a couple of dozen of uh, free books on my Kindle that I am like, oh yeah, that looks really good. I'll get to that one day, but but I don't. And that there's a difference there between that and when I when I spend three ninety nine or seven ninety nine or nine ninety nine for a book that you know I'm actually interested in. And so it's important that you're connecting with your audience and that uh, you're not going to kind of just get lost in in the midst. And so if you have a particular thing in mind that you want to accomplish with having your book out there for free. So for example, the Archangel Inc. self-publishing series is, is available for free. I think technically it's 99 cents on Amazon, but I say in the opening page, if you want it for free, you can get it in your inbox and then download it right away by coming over to the Archangel Inc. website. Uh, but like you, Jordan, with with uh, Book Launch Gladiator, it's designed to uh, inform people about what we're about and uh, orient them so that when they come to us for a free consultation, if that's something that they're interested in doing, they have a, a good basis of understanding. We, we can kind of start to speak the same language. And I think that's really valuable and it's it's worth it um, versus you know the handful of, of dollars that I might get in sales. I mean, even if it did really well, it wasn't designed to be a bestseller. It's really about introducing people and orienting people to the sorts of work that we do. Uh, same thing with the published professional. I think now it is available for two ninety nine, and you know I, I've always been a fan of having my uh, print editions uh, priced at a at, at a reasonable rate. I think nine ninety nine is where where they're both at um, for the series and the published professional, just because. Hey, there is value in what I what I have to say, and it costs money to print uh, these books, and I want to uh, I, I want to lead with value and and you know not devalue myself in that way. So um, the short answer is it depends on on what you're trying to do. If you are thinking about making your book available for free beyond just the advanced review copies that you know we've talked about before, um, have a plan in place. How are you going to uh, recapture? Some of that investment, and even if it's totally self-published, you know, you didn't bring out anybody else, but that investment in time and energy and in making it something really good. What are you going to do about it, rather than just uh, give it away? If if that's your if that's your goal, if you are looking to publish in a profitable manner, some people they think, you know, I just I just have this story, and I'm going to learn a little bit about publishing, and I want to put it out there, and if people love it, resonate with that resonate with it, that that's great. You know, it's sort of like a, a consolidated series of blog posts or something. Um, but most, again, most of the people that we end up working with are interested in um, it, turning some sort of profit, getting some sort of return on it. And for that reason, I'd be hesitant to recommend free, certainly not as a matter of course, um, but, um, you know, unless you have a, uh, an idea or a vision of what to do with it. Yeah, totally agree there, Rob. I definitely think the 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 answer to that question is is that value piece. You know, that was two and a half years ago that I launched it like that, and that was just kind of a, a test to see if it still works that way. Uh, and yeah, and I think right right now, best practices really are if you value valuing your work, you're going to get better people reading your book too. So like you said, you have a, you're not going to have a bunch of people downloading it and having it just sit on their mm -hmm. Kindle. You know, the people that you're going to eventually pull into your business or onto your platform, are you really just wanting people that are going to free, free, free all the time. Now, certainly there are really good techniques. Uh, you, uh, Jim mentioned to using something like a lead magnet. He mentioned that in his comment just there. Mm -hmm. As far as giving away things for free, yes, lead magnets, definitely, you know, that's something people still utilize a lot. You can do things for free to entice people to jump on uh, your email list and to your, into your network. Uh, but specifically with books, it may just not be the best option because you can put a, a 10, 10 to 11 page lead magnet together yourself or, or have a designer do it for for not potentially too, too much. But when you're talking about putting a book on Amazon and making it the best product you can be, it takes more time and energy and money than potentially putting a lead magnet together. So that's, I think that's like the biggest key difference there. So. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. The the level of professionalism, the investment yes. that's, that's going into it. You know, as uh, another colleague mentioned, um, actually, Hassan, who's come up before, he has a podcast and uh, he you know, does the, the basic audio editing and engineering himself for that. But he mentioned that when it comes uh, in, in that uh, podcast, when it comes to audiobook production, there's a different expectation. When somebody is purchasing something, mm -hmm. their their tolerance is going to be tighter. You know, they have a, um, a desire and an anticipation that there is going to be a, um, 
a very good, you know, level of production. And so, um, what may be acceptable for doing your own podcast um, may not be acceptable, you know, whether in terms of technical specifications or an audience expectation when you're actually recording your own audiobook. So you, you just want to make sure that everything is as strong as possible, and that's going to hold true for you know a a published book versus some sort of uh, shorter lead magnet. Um, but yeah, mm. great, great points, Jim. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Uh, all right, cool. Anything else on that topic? Nope, I'm good. All right. Number two, how long does it take to create my book Book once I have a finished manuscript? What say you, friend? What say I? Uh, it, uh, <laughs> as, as, as with any question on here, it does depend. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're at, you know, if you're finished, say you're finished your, uh, your own editing phase and your own proofreading, it does depend on the state of the manuscript. So that's where we recommended, uh, we talked a little bit about editing last week. Um, you know, we recommend getting your manuscript checked to see what level of editing you might need. That I think is really going to define your timeline because things like formatting and getting getting things like that together, pretty you know, pretty standard as far as how fast that's going to be done. I think for the most part, now you could probably find someone that could do it in a day, uh, and you might find someone uh, that's cheap but says, "Hey, it's cheap. I'll do it." You know, in the next. Four to eight months or something like that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully not. But uh, right. I think you could probably. I mean, it's generally going to be uh, what it's going to be, and I would say around. You know, you can expect a, a couple weeks to a month as far as formatting goes. But editing and doing that first part of the process really does depend upon the state of the manuscript. Um, yeah. But just uh, just a ballpark. Um, once you have it done, I would say anywhere from eight to twelve weeks. Really, just depending on on what how much work it needs. Yep. Yeah, I think that's accurate. One of the the our ballpark um, currently, and this is in part based on our current workload, is is around twelve to sixteen weeks mm -hmm. for for production. Now, um, it used to be, you know, when we first started out, and and we had um, you know fewer fewer clients and and a less uh, established process, you know, we might be able to do it uh, in six six to eight weeks. But uh, with with the level of of uh, production that we try to put into work these days, um, it does tend to take a little bit longer. Uh, and, and partly it's going to depend on the um, the speed in which you turn around edit reviews. So part of it, uh, at least in our process, is after each stage of editing, there's an opportunity for the author to go over and, and review it, provide some additional feedback, address any concerns, make adjustments as appropriate. And, uh, you know, if you if you need an extra several weeks to do that, then obviously that's going to, to change how quickly we're able to Mm -hmm. um, to turn and turn around and complete the project. I remember there was one, uh, one client, um, a few years ago who, uh, who reached out and we said, you know, we're looking around six to eight weeks here and we sent the first edit review over to him, you know, maybe at around week two and then around week five, we got uh, an email back. He said, okay, here's, uh, here, here is it back. I guess so we're, we're launching next week. It's like, no, no, unfortunately we can't do that. Uh, we actually have a lot more to go. And so, you know, we make sure to be very explicit these days that it's going to depend on the speed in which you're able to, to turn around that review. But, um, but yeah, I would say uh, 12 to 16 weeks is, is pretty reasonable, uh, at least for, for us. Um, professional productions, I mean, getting it turned around within a year from a major publishing house um, is usually pretty good. Oftentimes there is that, you know, uh, 10 to 18 month delay, but, um, you know, we try and be a little bit faster than that while still maintaining attention and, and care and, and so forth. Um, for, let's say the manuscript is already complete and you've already, um, you know, the uh, done all the editing, all the proofing, et cetera, um, you know, on our end for, for production within a month, typically to, you know, create the digital edition, the paperback edition, um, you know, the cover, et cetera. But, um, if you're doing it yourself, you know, you may, you may be doing, you may be able to do it faster. Or if you're just learning for the first time, it may take you longer. But uh, anyway, uh, it is another good, it depends kind of question, but uh, hopefully uh, ex uh, expanding on that a little bit is helpful. Yeah. And Jim asked just about the different levels of editing. I don't think that's an important, uh, a, a, you know, side question for that. Uh, yeah. Without going into it too much, I, I would share that, you know, it just that depends too because it, your book could need a complete like reorganization and if that's the case then that's more of a developmental edit uh, you're looking at you know moving potential sections around really pulling out what you're trying to say uh, when i have my editor go through my my books when i write them that's a huge thing that i do hey like i, I need help with this i don't even know i kind of know what i'm trying to say but i don't know i don't know if i'm saying it 
can I put something else here? Does this chapter need to be moved around and stuff like that? So that's a more developmental edit. Uh, next level after that is, I believe, the line edit. Rob, is the technical term for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, line, line edit is is uh, the common term. Um, so, so by the way, Jim, I just uh, put in there a link, uh, archangelinkcom slash editing, and I'll have to confirm and make sure that this is still the most current one. Uh, it looks like this was a couple of years old. I think the basics should still be there, but that is a little guide that we have. Uh, the first portion of it, it's a, it's a few page document is on the uh, the value of professional editing and why we think that it's important. Uh, and then the different levels of editing. But, um, but yeah, Jordan, as you mentioned, developmental edit is, is going to be kind of big picture. You know, we're building the foundation of, of your book, the foundation of your story, making sure everything sort of makes sense, that it runs together. Um, if it's, if it's fiction, that there are no uh, obvious holes or gaps or things that you think, well, what the, what the heck just happened? That doesn't make any sense. I never heard of that character before. Why is, you know, et cetera. Um, if it's nonfiction, you know, does it follow? Are, are you building upon your, um, your argument? You know, maybe a chapter that appears later needs to appear sooner or vice versa. Um, that's kind of big picture developmental stuff. Just make sure that the, the skeleton is there and appropriate. Uh, the next is going to be line editing. And that's that's what most people think about for, for editing. Uh, I suppose it depends. But that's about the craft of writing. Are we using the right sorts of words? Are we making the language as, as clear and as beautiful and as uh, appropriate for the topic, for uh, the intended audience, et cetera, uh, as we can. And, and that's going to be, you know, just kind of rearranging things and, and making it pop as much as, as possible. Um, the way we describe editing in general sometimes is, you know, we are your backup singers. So you're still the lead vocalist, but, you know, we want the other backup singers to make you sound really good. Uh, and the, the uh, line editing portion is a big part of that, just harmonizing with, with your vision and making it um, sound the way that you want it to. Uh, after that is going to be copy editing. And that's that's the kind of, you know, grammar and syntax and that kind of thing, just making sure, okay, there are, um, uh, are the words actually spelled right? Are there, you know, uh, the right tenses of words throughout the, um, the paragraph or the chapter? Is everything consistent in that way? Um, that's going to come to the sort of copy editing side of it. And then finally, proofreading uh, on our end, at least, is another round, uh, usually a different editor who's going to look at it and adjust any irrefutable issues and then also make sure some of the, um, the details are attended to. So, for example, if you had numbered lists through one chapter and then suddenly you switched to bulleted lists through another chapter, is there a reason for that or should that be consistent with the rest of the manuscript? Those kinds of things will pick up in... Um, in the proofing stage. So um, sorry, I, I kind of hijacked the mic there, Jordan, but um, hopefully that that uh, helped answer your questions, Jim. All right. So <laughs> uh, moving on. Are you all good? I am all good. Yep. Cool. Uh, next is KDP Select. Should I do it? So first off, what is KD KDP Select? And then we can answer whether it's worth doing. Okay, yeah, so KDP Select is something you would choose or select, if you will, if you will, for your book when you're uploading it into Amazon. And it's making your book exclusive to uh, Amazon. This is for Kindle, uh, the ebook edition. Uh, you're mm -hmm. making your book exclusive to Amazon. You can't offer your uh, ebook Kindle edition anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it puts you into the Kindle Unlimited Reading Program. It's the program you can, you can sign up for as a customer on Amazon for, I think it's still 10 bucks a month. Uh, and you can read any of the books in the program. Uh, and as the author, you get paid per pages read. Mm -hmm. So that's what that looks like. You know, if you, what, for whatever the uh, calculation is and it changes every month, I don't even know what, it, what it's at right now. Um, but if someone reads 200 pages of your book, you get, uh, you know, you get a certain amount for every page that they read and that combines over all the people reading your book. Mm -hmm book now as whether as as far as whether we would recommend it or not i've gone back and forth myself personally with this i've tried all the different ways at least for right now for june 11 2020 i reserve the right to change my mind tomorrow <laughs> but for the most part uh, i do not recommend it uh, for the for the reason being that for the most part when people and this is especially for nonfiction, it does change a little bit for fiction so definitely something to consider for fiction, especially if you have a long book, putting it in, the, in that program, especially like a long romance novel. I've heard those do really well in the KDP Select program. But as far as nonfiction books that are not super long in length, you're just not gonna be making enough per book. And that's if everyone is reading through your book all the way. A lot of people, even if they 
uh, you know, if they're paying for Kindle Unlimited, they're still going to borrow your book and potentially not even read any of it. Mm -hmm. So it's def it's just not it's not worth it enough as far as rankings, as far as Amazon algorithms go right now to be in that program if you're a nonfiction author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, great point. I would say if you're if you're under, let's say, 30,000 words or so and or um, especially if you are in nonfiction, it, it may not really be worth your while. It does seem to really value and prioritize those uh, longer books, you know, fiction books. It's kind of back in the day, I think they um, <laughs> uh, I think it was, you know, uh, was it Herman Melville or something, you know, would just um, they would be paid by the word. And so, you know, some of these, mm. these classic tags, they would, they would be long and they would be longer probably than they had to just because they were paid by the word. Huh. And, and in a way that's what, that's what the um, KDP select program does. It, it adjusts for um, uh, the normalized page count. And, you know, if you have uh, 80,000 words and it's a, a real page turner, well, that's, that's great. And that, that mm. prob probably would work out pretty well for you. However, if you are, you know, uh, if you have a, a book like uh, Published Professional or, um, you know, Book Launch Gladiator and we're around 10 or 12,000 words, even if someone loves it and, and runs through it, uh, they're not likely to uh, generate a whole lot of income for us uh, as, as authors, as, you know, rights holders for this title. Um, the other thing I will mention is uh, in addition to having it available in this program, when you, when you opt for KDP exclusive for that 90 day window, uh, you do have access to uh, a couple of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, one of those is the ability to make your book available for free. Uh, kind of talked about that a little while ago. And usually that's just for a promotional period, not a, a long time. Uh, it's a, capped at five days and you can do them non-sequentially during that period. So if you wanted two days you know, at the start, one day in the middle and two days at the end, you can do that. But it is, uh, it is not uh, something that you have access to if you are not a part of the KDP Select program, or the, they have the ability to do countdown deals, so you have a little timer and a a built-in sort of um, bit of urgency on your Amazon page listing. And, and the nice thing is, when you list it at that um, uh, at that uh, deal, uh, or excuse me, at that countdown deal price, um, I believe at least you know uh, last I checked, you still retain the full amount of your um, your earnings. Is that is that right, Jordan? Yep, you got it. Yep. Okay. So you can you can drop the part price lower, but every sale generated during that little window um, earns you the full amount of whatever uh, royalty you would earn otherwise. So yeah. So that is a nice bonus it, as a potential. Yeah. You because because you can offer it for ninety nine cents and still get the seventy percent royalties while mm -hmm. it's in that. And normally, if you put it at ninety nine cents, you can only get thirty five percent. So that's a that is an upside. Yep. It's funny that you mentioned those because, yeah, when we were thinking about this, I didn't even think about those because I've been outside of uh, the KDP camp for a while now. So, right, yeah, and, and it is it is an it, it is a decent idea, and it's mm -hmm. it's up for debate because again, it's very opaque with Amazon mm -hmm. uh, whether they may emphasize uh, select titles a little bit more in terms of their own internal yeah. algorithm and and cross referencing to people. Um, who are you know browsing similar genres as you find yourself in. So there could be some of that. I know that against uh, mentioning Hassan, he has advocated uh, in the past, if you're the first time author, put it on select. Just you know you can change it, spend that first 90 days promoting it there, trying to get some traction there. And then you can figure out if you want to make it uh, available non-exclusive, if you want to go to different distribution channels, um, whether any either of those promotional uh, platform or promotional options, uh, the countdown deal or the free, uh, free window, uh, are going to move the needle for you. And, um, but as a, as a starting place, he, he said, Hey, go ahead, put it in KDP select and, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, in, you know, in this case, especially because of the, the kind of clientele that we work with and the encouragement to, you know, build some of these other, avenues to their business and and take advantage on a couple of different fronts of, of their writing of the content that they're producing you know i'm not sure that making it available for that little um especially for a a non-fiction author um is is going to be particularly helpful so like you on on june 11th 2020 right now i would say uh <laughs> no but you know uh, it is something to look into and it's a great question yeah, I think with any of those type questions, Rob, it's easy to get on the other side of the camp and be like, no, you, 
definitely shouldn't do this. No, don't do mm -hmm. that. But things do change. So I think I like that we kind of have that stance of like, and this is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. But like we've said with and things things with Amazon can change on the drop of a hat. So that's why it's you know we're not doing that just because we you know we're trying to save our butts you know maybe a little bit. But I think we just reserve the right to you know to change based on new information. And I think that's a great. Uh, approach for anyone that's in self-publishing or new to self-publishing, just be willing to to hear uh, different sides, but also new data that's coming out and take take it with a grain of salt and base it off what you know to be true and then experiment yourself. I think that's, you know, you got to do a lot of your own experimenting mm -hmm. just to see uh, what works and what's going to work for you and your genre and your book and your writing style. There's so many different uh, questionable, you know, different pieces of that. Uh, you know, just because one person out there says it's the, the best way or not the best way doesn't mean for your specific situation that it's not going to be. And that mm -hmm. doesn't really answer a question. It probably throws more questions out there, but just something to think about. <laughs> yep. No, I, I, uh, great, great points all around. Uh, Jim mentions that uh, agrees uh, regarding nonfiction for KDP it doesn't seem to be worth it. Um, he's experimented with six months and it's not worth it overall. Um, also, he asked, can you discuss pre-launches uh, in the future and, and maybe we can dive into that a little bit more, but uh, we can address that briefly if um, if you'd like here, Jordan. Uh, any thoughts on pre-launch? Yeah, pre-launch, when I think of that question, Jim, I think, you know, just what are we doing before we're actually uh, launching the book? What what type of marketing am I working on? And, and I don't know if you're wondering specifically that or about pre-orders in general, but yeah, if you're thinking pre-launch or pre pre-orders, I mean, doing work before is really about doing the things that are going to help you to build your platform and also the things that are going to take a lot of time. So book reviews, reaching out to people, uh, getting people to read your book. I mean, you, that takes a lot of time on your end, but it also takes a lot of time when you're asking people to, to actually sit down and read your book and give you a quality review. So anything for me when I'm thinking, uh, in, in short, when I'm thinking pre-order or pre-launch, Really, that's that's the time frame you're going to be doing your most time consuming marketing tasks that you mm -hmm. you need time to get done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why for for our purposes, when we are working with clients directly, uh, we'll have the the finished book completed, you know, the editing done, um, the the review process um, or, or excuse me, uh, the edit reviews, as well as the uh, finished file reviews by the author. Uh, once we have that in hand, that's when we look to the, the launch period in earnest because there's a lot of different balls that you're juggling when you're uh, putting a, a book out there and we want you to be able to focus we want our clients to be able to focus on on the task at, at hand rather than being pulled in four different directions and uh, maybe not being able to uh, put as much into it as as we need to so we always wait uh, 30 days after the the finished files are in hand before we're we're even starting to set a uh, a launch date you know, because like you mentioned, Jordan, um, you're going to need that that time of focus and and putting your um, putting yourself to those various different tasks and not um, being pulled in multiple directions. Yeah, as much as you can have that have that gap between you know you're doing marketing all the time, um, but like you were just saying, Rob, as much as you can, you, okay, you, my book's done now. Now I'm focusing all my energy mm -hmm. on marketing because marketing does take a lot of time and energy and you know tweaking and figuring stuff out. Uh, it's definitely worthwhile to spend your time on that when it's not when you're not distracted by your you know editing or trying to get other things done for your book as much as you can. Now there's always going to be things that come up that you have to deal with, uh, but as much as much as you can, you know, separating those those tasks out can we found to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, cool. All right, let's uh, let's move on. We've got next question number four. How would you recommend that I improve my writing? Um, great question. Big question. Uh, you can start it off again uh, here, Jordan, if you'd like. Sure. Yeah, I have two suggestions. The first one is obvious. The first one is just write more. Uh, that's something we all can do. Uh, it's something I can do better and more of. Uh, just just try to keep writing. You know, it may not have to be every day. It just depends on how consistent and how regular you want to be with that. Um, but yeah, just write more. And that's how you can see. You know, you put yourself out there. People are going to give you comments and and, and whatnot. Second suggestion I have would be to use a program like Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid. Mm -hmm. I use Pro Writing Aid. I just renewed my uh, subscription with them. It costs about fifty to sixty dollars a year to have that app with them, and I'm not sure what Grammarly's price is. Uh, I found using something like that invaluable because it just it's 
I, you know, I, I do my first uh, run through with my writing. I try not to edit. I try to just get that first draft done. Uh, and then I go through and I reread, make sure I'm saying what I want to say, you know, from a, a content development, uh, developmental edit kind of self, mm -hmm. self done through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then before I'm getting ready to finish it up, I go through and actually use that pro writing aid and have it do a, a grammar check. Um, it, it catches more things than just the uh, Google Docs or Word um, proofreader will catch. It catches uh, the grammar issues and things that, and it's just basically other ways to improve your writing. Basically, you know, it, it'll say things like, hey, you've already said this here multiple times, or you've started your sentence with the same the same word, you know, three times in a row, things like that, that, and, you know, you're not, you might not catch going through and no, uh, you know, automatic, uh, you know, Google Doc or Word thing is going to catch. But what that does and what it's helped me do is when I'm writing off the platform or in different places, I don't always have to uh, run that because I'm getting better as a writer of being more concise in what I'm in what I'm saying. And that I know that has personally helped me a lot. Uh, so I, I would recommend a tool like that. Uh, and there may be other ones other than pro writing and Grammarly out there uh, yeah. that other people have used, but I found it personally helpful. Cool. Yeah, great, great insight. The other thing that I would add, um, and I think those are both good recommendations, particularly writing more consistently and, and engaging with your audience, you know, ideally, is um, read a lot. Be, be a good uh, student. You know, uh, figure out what people in your in your genre are talking about, how they're talking about it, how they're framing things, and and then read widely. It doesn't have to be just in your genre. So you know, might be a nonfiction writer, but you know, it can be really helpful to read some fiction sometimes. And, you know, you may be focused on, let's say, again, in nonfiction, being as um, concise and clear and to the point as possible, and, and less concerned with uh, sort of the uh, uh, the beauty of language and, you know, flowing and having uh, sort of interesting, compelling prose. But um, but it's a good idea to expose yourself to that. And and the more you can integrate the, the best practices and the, um, you know, craft of, of great writing into your content um, that you learn by observation and by immersion, uh, the better that you will be as a writer. It's it's a long process. Everybody is going to you know go about it in different ways, but just continue to uh, to read, to uh, practice the craft, and uh, over time, you know, kind of like the um, thing we've talked about before. Uh, good artists have great taste, and and they have a sense of like what's good and true and beautiful, and they're they're aspiring toward that. But um, but they may not be able to reach it right away. But you just you get there through iteration, and and eventually you reach a point where um, you're capable of producing something you, that you know is is actually really good and, and up to standard, and that you would love to to read yourself. Um, and then you keep pushing and keep doing that, and uh, and that just comes again with uh, with practice and retaining consistency. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, moving on. How do I keep track of my tax information, or is it automated on Amazon? This is assuming, of course, that we're on KDP. Um, great question. Uh, anything you want to start off with there, Jordan? No, I was just going to say it, it's uh, it's a question that we get a lot on how to you know how to do this, and Amazon for the most part will keep track of the information for you. I know they issue 1099, 1099s for you. They will send that to you and calculate how much uh, they paid you, and then you're able to use that to calculate your taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other part of the, part of this question that we've gotten, Rob, and I'm not, I don't remember what the answer ended up being, but people are asking about, hey, if I have a print book and I'm selling it in person, do I need to collect sales tax or, or anything like that? And I remember you had answered that one if you want to uh, answer that part of it, but that's all I had to say for taxes. I'm not a tax guy for, for for, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in terms of, of collecting sales tax and so forth, um, typically typically not. I mean, Amazon will be responsible for for that. And so uh, in different markets, there may be a VAT tax added. Uh, and you can indicate whether that VAT tax, that's value added tax, um, is going to be embedded in the uh in the list price or is going to be add, added afterwards. So for example, if you make your book available for $4.99 uh, or four pounds 99 um, in the UK it was four pounds 99 quid. I'm not sure um, you can, uh, you can say, Hey, that is um, that includes VAT tax. So your actual sale price is going to be maybe uh, four and a half pounds, you know, and that extra uh, half pound or half quid or yeah, half pound is going to be uh, where the value added tax is. Or you can say, no, uh, that's before the VAT tax. So the actual price that somebody will end up paying 
might end up being five and a half you know, pounds. But um, but no, you don't have to collect sales tax. Typically, um, you know, that's handled on Amazon's end. And then, as you mentioned, it's going to uh, they're going to issue you, at least in the United States, a 1099 um, MISC, mm -hmm. which is miscellaneous. And they're going to uh, include all earnings uh, in your, um, you know, for the year. Um, at that point, that is considered um, Schedule C income or, or independent contractor income. And you're responsible for uh, your own taxes on it. The, the general recommendation is 25 uh, withhold or set aside 25% of your earnings for for taxes. Um, but that's uh, the other thing that you're permitted because it is independent contractor income or self-employed income. Uh, you can take deductions if there are qualified deductions to be had. So mm -hmm. if you're an author and you say, hey, I, I made $1,000 this, uh, this month, but I spent $200 in advertising. Uh, then actually, as far as the government's concerned, you actually only netted eight hundred dollars, and and that's your tax liability rather than than the full thousand. So you can, um, you know, again, co consult tax professionals and yeah. and look into it. Um, if anybody's interested in, in more of that, I'm happy to to chat. That's something that um, I work on as well. But um, yeah, in general, uh, the the tax information will be provided by Amazon at the end of the year. They're required to send it out uh, and make it available to you uh, by the end of January following the tax year that any earnings were accrued. Um, so good, uh, good question. Um, Jim says, Amazon in UK seems to collect sales tax and uh, we have uh, that added. Uh, quid is slang for pounds. Thank you. I appreciate that, Jim. Um, good, good to know. Um, now there is a book to be written. Learn, learn the UK slang. Um, cool. So, so four and a half versus five quid, uh, aka pounds. Um, all, uh, all the same. Christy is in the audience. Thanks, Christy, for dropping by. Hi, I it. Um, so, hopefully, that answers uh, some of those questions. Again, if you have particular questions, uh, let me know. I'm glad to uh, to get more into tax stuff and have a track it and and uh, how to maintain your books. Uh, we do have another live video in which we kind of went over some of that and uh, you can search that in the YouTube um, YouTube bar, uh, search bar if you would like. So moving on, number six, um, should I still use book promotion sites like BookBub, uh, BuckBooks and Robin Reads? This is, this is a great question and I'm uh, eager to hear your thoughts on this short. Yeah, so this used to be prevailing wisdom to uh, use a bunch of sites uh, like BuckBooks and Robin Reads and, uh, you know, Book Baby, Book Bear, Book Lemur. Uh, you know, those are all, I don't know, Book Baby, that's something else. But, you know, add book, you know, animals and all kinds of different <laughs> things. You know, there, there, there's so many different ones out there. Uh, Book Doggy, that's another one that's actually pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but thinking of these things, you know, it's it was definitely the, you know, and we talk about the, the free launches, it was more in, in that stage. It was a stage maybe, uh, you could probably write a book on self-publishing stages and of marketing mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do that or why, but you know, it's a, <laughs> potentially an option. Uh, but yeah, this really isn't, you know, to, to make a long story short, this isn't the prevailing wisdom anymore. Yes, you should still submit your book for a BookBub deal. Uh, BookBub seems to be uh, the one that still really does work. And just a step back, these are platforms that send emails out to their lists that list your book and say, hey, you know, this book is on sale for 99 cents or it's free at this time, you know, you'd like to download it. So basically they're just doing you a service by uh, offering, you know, you pay them a little bit of money and then they send an email to their book list. Now, BookBub, yes, we would still recommend that. It's very hard to get on. Uh, I, I think last time I, I was, I read it was like 80 from 80 percent or 85 percent uh, of people are rejected it's probably even more than that in in all reality uh, most people that just submit through there uh, are most likely going to be rejected unfortunately uh, but it's still it's as far as a big hit i think they have over at least they report having over a million people on their email list that they're willing that they will send the book out to mm -hmm. so as far as numbers go and value uh, everything that I've, that I've seen just really show, tell, shows you that BookBub is, is still the way to go. Now, we still use BookBooks to set up a promo for launch day, but for the most part, we don't recommend or use any of the other ones. Uh, we've seen uh, very diminish, diminished returns uh, over the years that we've been doing launches. And, you know, when we originally were doing things, yeah, we'd use these and get some sales and it would, it would help push the, the launch day algorithms. 
Uh, now we've just had to be a little bit more creative in our in our marketing and really focus more heavily on Amazon ads. Uh, you know, we did a series on Amazon ads, and that's really where our recommendations go as far as, hey, if you're going to spend money to put your book in front of people, you might as well just spend the money on Amazon. You know, spend spend thirty dollars on an ad on Amazon versus you know having, uh, you know. 30 or 20 or $30 for an email newsletter that only nets you like five to 10 sales. Uh, you're going to be able to probably do a lot more ROI wise, uh, putting those, putting that money into Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great points. Uh, I just want to mention real quick, uh, something that Jim pointed out from last, last question, last comment here. Um, in the UK, you have to fill out your tax info when joining, and that is the case in the U S as well. So you will have a, a tax profile that's filled out and that is, that is required. Amazon will let you make the book available without that. And, and that's partly how they're able to provide you the necessary uh, documentation and then also provide in the case of the United States, the IRS, the documentation. Um, okay. So moving on to, uh, to this question though, it, it's a really good one. So I want to give a little, little history and um, an insight, just very quick summary of, of what you mentioned during these different eras and phases in, mm -hmm. um, in publishing, because, you know, I started out uh, some years back and, and at the time, it was just having a book on uh, available uh, as a digital downloading downloadable um, uh, item was was almost enough to you know generate some sales. It's like hey you know there's there's yeah. um, you know twenty or forty books in this genre. I like this genre. I can get this book right away. I can download it right now. Yeah, sign me up for it. And and you really didn't have have to do a whole lot because the competition was really low and the novelty was very high. Um, and that is, you know, sometimes uh, I refer to and other people refer to the um, the Kindle gold rush, you know, kind of the golden era. You just had to have a book up there and you were, you know, the gold was basically, you know, uh, jumping out of the ground at you and, and you could make a make a decent profit without having to do too much. Um, you know, when uh, and that was just before my time, I mean, it was kind of at the tail end of when I got involved. Um, after that, th we realized that actually there was um, there were some things that uh, we needed to do to stand out. And so. Uh, one of the one of the things was, you know, just have a um, you know a good book cover, and and that maintain uh, continues to be the case. Um, but uh, as mentioned, we could sort of uh, make the book available for a few days on free, switch it over to the paid store, boom, you get a bunch of sales. Um, then we realized that doesn't actually work all that reliably. Um, people were becoming a little bit more discerning, and so that's that's why we started Buck Books. And uh, Buck Books was designed, you know, initially off of uh, the existing email list that. Um, my co-founder had as a way to uh, promote his material and then other material of, of authors that we were working with, um, as well as other kind of high profile people, um, you know, that we would reach out to and say, hey, we'd love to, to promote this right now. We've got a, a lot of active, you know, eager to buy people. Um, make your book available for 99 cents uh, for, for just a book, uh, for just a buck. And, um, and then you can sell a bunch of copies right away that catches the attention of Amazon. Amazon says, hey, this book is important and switch it back over to uh, a higher price point. And then those sales, you know, would would generally continue for at least a little while, um, making up in, in um, uh, overall volume, the difference that you would lose by selling um, at 99 cents versus whatever your, your previously listed price was. Um, so that worked for a little while and that was cool. But um, but over time, people became kind of inured to it because it's there's just so many um, of those platforms out there, and and people realize, hey, if I just make my book available for ninety nine for ninety nine cents, drive some traffic over, everybody kind of participates, you know, in the in a bulk event, and one day sends their respective audiences over, um, mm -hmm. then I can make a ton of money. Um, let's reproduce that model. Okay, so everybody reproduced that model and, and it became saturated. People are like, okay, another, you know, another book event, another, you know, something like been there, done that. I I don't have any time or interest. I don't care about that anymore. Um, maybe I'll still be signed up to that, you know, to this or that email list because occasionally a, a book that I'm interested in might be available, but it was no longer a, a go-to thing. I mean, it was actually modeled off of some of these you know, uh, affiliate programs, you know, non Amazon based programs where everyone would get together, they put, you know, $300 or $3,000 of value into a book and you'd sell it for, you know, a 10th of the price that they would pay otherwise. So, you know, they'd sell it for a hundred bucks or, uh, you know, uh, 300 bucks or something, but you're getting, you know, $3,000 worth of, mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and that was really cool. Um, but, but again, you know, people just became kind of, um, uh, uh, tired of it. It just stopped losing its, or it lost its potency. It stopped losing its effect. 
So uh, that's kind of where where we are today. And um, there are a couple of other things that Amazon has done that's that's really geared, at, I think, ultimately for the best, um, which is uh, to try to emphasize quality and and durability over time, not flash in the pan stuff. I mean, you know, there's only so much that you can do in in a launch, and we we try and help, but but these days it's more. I, I think of the launch as uh, like a boot camp program, you know, something to help you like get in shape and get in the habit of doing something. But you do a six week boot camp, that doesn't mean that you know um, at seven weeks you're going to step onto a bodybuilding stage. You know, like it, you're just not going to achieve the, um, uh, yeah, or, or step onto the Olympic stage or something like that, you know, yeah. um, you're, you're, that's going to require consistent, prolonged effort and, and, you know, marketing engagement with your audience. Um, that really has to be what you're about all the time. If, if you want to be a content creator, I mean, that's kind of what is expected. I mean, there are a handful of people of authors who are going to go out and, you know, they're going to be, uh, in the shadows and they're going to release a book every so often and people love it. And they're willing to deal with with waiting, you know, six months or a year between hearing from their their favorite author before they find something again. But for the most part, the expectation with with social media, with um, people's own websites, blogs, YouTube channels, podcasts, et cetera, is hey, you've got to be interacting, you've got to have this this relationship be a regular part of their lives, and that's what's going to distinguish you from the next author and make them say, hey, when that book is out, absolutely, like I'm I'm ready to open my wallet and pull up my credit card and, and make that happen. Um, so that's kind of kind of big picture um, sense of, of what's going on, and and consequently, the the hacks that we um, that we may be doing or that people have been doing in the past, they just don't they don't work anymore. It's hard to it's hard to be a flash in the pan. It's hard to just you know strong arm your way into people's hearts and minds. Um, again, we on our end do everything that we can to kind of put the put the odds in your favor, get all those details right, but. Um, there's nothing, you know, even even uh, BookBub, um, which is still very good and, and curated, and you have to pay to be a part of it, pay a fair sum to be a part of it. And, you know, they put a lot of effort into segmenting their audiences, uh, their audience, so that people are really interested in that book um, or, or in the titles that they, they list. Um, even that, you know, it's no substitute for... Um, you know, just consistent, sustained work and in, in developing developing that relationship, continuing to do that marketing. Um, I mean, I wish there was like it was awesome. It was awesome when we were able to say, hey, let's just run a quick bug book promotion and, you know, we're going to make a return on that investment. No problem. But um, it, it doesn't work that way. There's so many other people trying to do that, that you really have to um, have to stand out through quality, through consistency, through through hard work and um Thank you for listening to that uh, that long aside. No, I, I I think personally, Rob, that 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 is so good. The only thing I would want to uh, that you know I doesn't really need anything added to it, but I think uh, I really like the the big picture approach there because it really does depend on that relationship building. I think that's what mostly marketing is, right? It's relationship building with your mm -hmm. people, and if you're focusing on that and making a really good quality product, always coming back to uh, one of my favorite authors and content creator, Pat Flynn, always says, like, how are you serving your audience? What are you doing to serve your people? And if you're answering that question on a consistent basis and really working for your audience, you're not going to go wrong. You're not going to have to rely on these quick flash in the flash in the pan, like uh, hacks that are going to get you through. Because for the most part, people are going to become aware. Businesses like Amazon are going to are going to become aware to those things. And it's just not going to work at, in a long term way. Now, yeah, like, you might get lucky and find something that is working right now that no one else has thought of yet. Uh, and it's a really quick, flashy, you know, hack on how to sell a bunch of books on Amazon. But for the most part, you're, you're probably not going to find that. You have to do the hard work. Uh, get, like you said, get yourself a really good book and put the work in to do the marketing. Mm -hmm. The only yeah. other thing else I want to say, it's a party now because Dale's here. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Dale? Uh, Dale, you know what today is, right? And specifically, you know what we're leading up for for tomorrow. I think you do, Dale. Um, Christy mentions, and this is great. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, book cover promo, $150 off through the end of this month. Uh, we're very excited to to offer that. A lot of uh, folks find us through through book covers. So um, that is something that we have available. If you are in the market for a book cover, reach out to us, let us know, and uh, we would love to chat a little bit and see if we may be able to help. Um, and Jim says, uh, can you expand on developing a relationship with readers, provide some examples? So yeah, great. Uh, great question. Um, the, all the things that we've talked about before, you know, having having some other platform, uh, having some way to interact with them. You know, 
what do they say, the, the big three of, of how you interact with your audience, either in front of the camera, kind of like what we're doing right now, YouTube, you know, even non-record or non-live videos, um, behind the mic, podcasts, you know, um, that kind of thing, radio shows, um, or behind the keyboard. So um, social media, you know, whether that's uh, that's tweeting or um, uh, having your, your own blog, uh, having, you know, Facebook posts, et cetera. I mean, one of our authors, is uh, is Tommy Baker, and he writes really good content on an almost daily basis on his Facebook page, and um, it's it's usually you know essay essay length, probably a thousand thousand words, um, maybe a couple of thousand words, but it's very consistent and it's good, it's pointed, it's heartfelt. Um, you know, he has a lot of a lot to say, and he shares that on a regular basis. And so, somebody who's interested in, in Tommy, who's following uh, following his stuff, you know, who has that relationship with him, he shows up in their their Facebook feed on an almost daily basis. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm reading that and saying, you know, right on, man, and you're and a asking some questions, getting some engagement, um, when he says, hey, by the way, I've got a new book out, you know, it's going to be launching on such and such date, I'm thinking, absolutely, like this guy has has given me so much. Um, every day he's, he's a part of my life. I'm ready to, to make that, uh, make that purchase and support him when the time comes. And, and if there's other ways I can support him, if I have my own podcast, if I have my own, um, uh, website where I do book reviews or, or something like that, then, um, then I'm absolutely interested in doing that too, because this person is uh, a regular part of my life. So, um, so great, uh, great question. And yeah, and, and whatever, whatever it is that you are doing, I mean, you don't have to be um, you know, a Twitter and, you know, commenting every day or anything like that. But for us, like our, our way of engaging with, with our audience, we're here, you know, on a weekly basis. And sometimes we'll have some additional posts, um, additional videos that go up, but, but this is a way of maintaining some sort of regular connection that, uh, that again provides for, for our purposes, a resource library, but, um, you know, also that, that sort of audience engagement and, uh, yeah, happy, happy to answer, but great question. Uh, great question, Jim. Yeah. And, and I would expand on that too. Just, you know, if you're in a situation where you can, you are able to connect one-on-one -on -one with your, your followers or people that are interested. I mean, it could be through Facebook, email, social media, video, uh, that can certainly be helpful for your people. Uh, but also for you to get to know what, what types of questions they have, what, what you can answer, what you can help with. I think sometimes just having that conversation is huge. Uh, and for me, like as an introvert, as someone that like, I don't really want to be talking to people all day, I've had to really wrestle with that, but it really can be, uh, it can be extremely valuable to, especially to hop on, hop on the phone or get on a video call with people. We, you know, we're starting to be able to have coffee with people again. So that's an option too. Uh, that is highly valuable meeting, meeting people for coffee and just seeing how you can help uh, each other. I mean, I, as far as like, you know, obviously you, it, that's harder to scale, but if you're in a situation where you can, uh, do that. I think more the more one on one uh, relationship building you can do, the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, uh, uh, great points, Jordan. Uh, all right, let's move on. Number seven. What is one marketing tactic I can implement right now? We have a cheat, uh, cheat sheet. Actually, <laughs> the answer is already in the parentheses. Um, oh no! Oh no! But uh, put your your book link in your email signature. So great, uh, great little tip, and uh, it's something that you know we've we've mentioned and, and recommended before. Uh, why why does that work? Why is that a good idea? Uh, I re I recommend that, and I do that myself whenever I'm launching a new book because yeah, if you're emailing people, you you may not think to to put a note in there, or you may not want to you know, hey, by the way, actually I'm launching a book too. It's a really soft way of just sharing with people that may have not known or just needed that one more reminder. Um, talk a lot about in marketing about just giving people, you know, consistent exposure to you and what you're doing. Uh, maybe they heard about you on Facebook and they got an email or, or, you know, they saw you on YouTube live or something like that. And then they get an email from you with a link to your book. Maybe your book isn't, it is, it's not this new thing that they're just learning about in an email signature. Maybe they're just like, oh, I, I was meeting on, I was meaning to check that out. Hey, I'm going to click over and, and, and see what's going on there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think they're, um, uh... You could do it a couple of ways that before the book is out, you can mention, Hey, um, you know, uh, my new book coming out this summer and then include a link, you know, either to your landing page or to, you know, if you have it available as a, um, a presale on Amazon to that page, uh, afterward, you can adjust it a little bit and say, have you already read such and such include the link? Um, an honest review is, um, you know, it's the kindest, um, thanks that you can offer or something like that. Just remind people what they can do 
to to help. So that's you know not just marketing the book. Um, obviously, it is because the book is uh, you're you're reminding people who haven't purchased it already. But um, you know, have you already read such and such, the published professional? Um, uh, please leave uh, an honest review on Amazon or you know whatever it is, and and that can be uh, a helpful way to continue to show relevance to uh, to Amazon. It's you know if you have those reviews trickling in on a recurring basis, if you're in contact with people in your network, um, and and you know every so often, once a month or you know once a season or something, somebody goes and and writes that review. Um, that is going to help it uh, help Amazon think. Okay, people are still reading it. This is still useful. This is still valuable. They're still engaging with it. Um, and that is going to be advantageous. So, yep. So with that, just think about the different ways that you can expand on that too. You know, don't just don't just you know put it in your email signature and then okay, I've done that. Think of other places that you are and that you have content. Uh, yeah, you could potentially put it up as a banner on your website if you have one. If you have a Facebook page, you could you could be maybe even make uh, put it in your profile picture. I mean, that's just an option I just thought of. I don't know what that would look like. But just yeah. think of the different ways that you can give people that, you know, just that, that one more ounce of exposure uh, to your book and one more entry point. Yep. Yeah. I, the, just to reiterate your point from a moment ago, Jordan, so, uh, you need multiple um, instances of being exposed to something before you really start to take seriously the idea of, of bringing it into your life. And so this is a, a low um, low stakes, you know, low stress, um, not hard salesy kind of way of, of just providing that continual exposure. And I think that was also a good, good idea. You know, just think laterally, what are different ways that I can, um, that I'm already interacting with people, whether, you know, through my, um, uh, through my signature or, you know, through my profile picture or through my avatar, if I'm involved in, you know, some sort of, um, you know, a blogging community or something like that. And, uh, yeah, including, including something below, uh, to, to lead people back to what you'd like. Um, great, uh, great notion. Uh, Christy has to run. Uh, thanks for joining us, Christy. We're glad to have you. Dale says it's an excellent strategy. You are very welcome, Dale. Happy to, happy to share. Thank you for, uh, the good feedback on it. And, um, we're almost at an hour and, and we still have a couple of questions left, so we can, we can try and, uh, make our way through. So number eight, uh, do you have anything else you want to say on that, Jordan? No, no I'm good. Okay, cool. Uh, can I take endorsement quotes and advertise them on uh, as an Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn post? Great, uh, great idea. Great question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if someone's giving you an endorsement on your book, uh, unless they're giving you an endorsement with a, a caveat and say, and they say, "Hey, I only want this to be in a certain place," which is very unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, unless they're giving you a specific. Uh, you know, parameters around that. Yeah, share it, put it on, put it on, you know, you can make quotes, posts, um, mm -hmm. or images with those endorsements. Yeah. Use that. I mean, the whole, the whole point and I, and I, and the idea of getting an endorsement from someone is that they're giving you permission to use their words to help you share your book. So yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, great. Great point. I will give one example in which there may be some limitations around, mm -hmm. uh, around the endorsement and, and sharing it. Uh, but even so there might be a workaround. So, on the Archangel Inc. main page, we have a, a testimonial from uh, from one of our uh, authors. Uh, he has a book, The Financial Planning Puzzle, and he's a financial planner. And there are some very particular guidelines around what financial planners are allowed to put um, uh, put out there. You know, have their name attached to. And so he had he wrote it up, and it took a little while. He actually had to get clearance. Uh, in order to make it available publicly. Um, and, and then we had to publish it exactly, you know, as it was written, as is. Um, because again, there are there are guidelines having to do with, you know, fiduciary responsibilities and, and you know, uh, removing conflicts of interest and so forth. Um, all very good and, and helpful in the, in that industry. Um, but in our case, um, yeah, we had to we had to do that. So um, I wouldn't necessarily go and, and pull parts of his words out and then repurpose them for a post. But what I would do potentially is, you know, take a screenshot, take a screenshot of uh, of it as it appears on our website, as it's been cleared. Um, even if you're not using the, um, you know, uh, the text itself. Hey, you know, thanks to uh, thanks to Jason for uh, for the kind review here, and um, yeah, just make that available. But yeah, good good thought, good question. No consider no concerns really uh, for repurposing that as long as you're doing it in a way that seems, you know, consistent and tasteful um, with your overall branding. Uh, great way to get that uh, additional vouching and, and proof from um, from your audience. All right. Yeah, number nine. Uh, when can I set up my author central account and how? How do I do that? 
Yeah, you can do this as soon as you publish a book. Uh, so you do have to wait until you get your book uploaded into Amazon for them to generate your page. Uh, now, if you're uploading a second book, then you would have already had an Author Central. And if you don't and you're uploading a second book, you can go and do that at any point. But yeah, if you're on your first book, if you're a first time author, you do have to wait until you publish your book on Amazon. And then you just want to go to Amazon's Author Central. Central. So just type in Author Cent Amazon Author Central into Google. I'm not sure what the exact link is, but you can do that. Uh, you do have to uh, just sign in with your Amazon uh, account information and then uh, search your name and find your book. And it'll give you a series of prompts that say, just say, add my book. So you find your book, you add your book, and then uh, Amazon will build that page for you. You'll be able to put your headshot in there, a little author bio, uh, and links to your website. And the, the whole reason this is important is that when you, uh, when you're, when you, on your books page, your author name will show up there, and then people are would be are able to click on your author name and find out more about you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you don't have an author central, uh, an author profile set up, if people click on your author name, it will just go to a search page instead. So it won't have information about you. It'll just be a search page for your name, and will potentially have other things uh, there. So it's a good idea to set that up just to give people a little bit more information about you if they're if they're curious. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's, that's particularly helpful too, if you have a, a little bit of a more common name. So, you know, if you're, if your name yeah. is Dan Smith and you're searching for it, uh, if you don't have your own dedicated page that is uh, framed in the way that you want and, and giving people the information that you'd like to present about yourself, <laughs> then it might just do a general search for, you know, Dan Smith and find a bunch of other titles. And somebody might say, oh, Dan Smith also wrote this other book. I'm going to click on that and buy it because I really want to support him. It turns out it's not the same Dan Smith. You know, it, it may not happen all that often, but um, but yeah, it just gives you another way to um, uh, show professionalism for one, and then to frame how people experience you as an author. And um, you know, you again can can add uh, those different um, different elements, images, uh, website. Um, a little bio, I think also gives you an option to create a, a feed if you have a blog post or something like that. You know, you can integrate all of that so people can can get a um, uh, an opportunity to get to know you that way. So, cool. All right, number 10, audiobook copyright page. Is this needed? Should I include a copyright page on my audiobook? Um, yeah, it's a great question. We got asked this recently, and I've wondered it myself, too, in the past. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, books, e either Kindle or print, it's very easy to put a disclaimer or a copyright page in there with some different information, like just to give you added protection. Mm -hmm. uh, when people, when you're listening to a book, uh, they don't generally, and for, at least for the most of the audiobooks that I've read, they're not going to sit there and read a three paragraph copyright to mm -hmm. start a book. It's not the most exciting way to start a book. So it's different. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard any of the rules anywhere, Rob. I just know it's, it's not typical practice. Uh, mm -hmm for you know, audiobook narrators to read an entire copyright page. Now, uh, Audible, Amazon does want you to add in the copyright year, uh, but they don't, as far as copyright year and author name and publisher, they don't really require you to say anything else in the beginning, I, I believe. I believe copyright for the most part is implied within the audiobook. Yes, it is. And uh, it, I mean, it's implied in general at, at any time you are putting together a creative work. And you know, we've talked a little bit before about whether you need to you know, register your copyright or, or so forth. But um, in general, in general, we don't recommend it. It's not strictly necessary. Um, and yeah, there there are a lot of different things that we don't include typically that we advise authors not to include in their audiobook uh, script, in their audio script. You know, so a table of contents is very helpful, but not particularly useful if you're listening to somebody say, "Hey, chapter three is going to be this, and chapter four is going to be this," because you know, if you if you have it available in audiobook, then then they can skip around and go directly to those chapters if they if they want to. They don't have to have you. They don't have to listen to mm -hmm. a minute and a half of you reading it. Um, we also generally don't include you know uh, references and appendices and you know um, sometimes other front matter you know uh, disclaimers or um, dedications. You know those are nice in print editions, but they may not be may, may not read as well in a an audio format. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a couple, some of our authors will do that. They will include some sort of copyright and just say, hey, you know, this is um, this is licensed to the particular user, and you know, you, you don't have permission to reproduce it or redistribute it and so forth. But in general, um, we don't advise it just because 
when we're looking at the audio edition, we're trying to foreground the, the listening experience of the audience. And um, that's going to be distracting. And, and it may, you know, if you have three or five minutes of uh, dedication and then the, you know, disclaimers um, and then the copyright notice, they think, gosh, I'm not, even, I'll get to this later. And then they might not, may not actually engage with, uh, with the material. And that is unfortunate and, and we don't want to do that. So uh, the other, the other part of it too, from a production standpoint, you're including all of that. That's just additional cost. You know, it scales more or less linearly. So if you can save yourself 500 words of you know, various uh, disclaimers and notices and, and so forth, then uh, it's that much less to uh, produce the, the title. But it is a good question. Yep. Moving on, and we've got a couple of bonus ones. I know we're already at an hour, so thanks for sticking with us, everybody. But uh, we'll try and get through these last couple quick. Um, first question, am I permitted to include in affiliate links in my book? So really good and important question. Uh, what's your experience been, Jordan? Do you have thoughts or I, I'm happy to jump on that and, and share what I've, um, what I've come across? Yeah, you can go first. I'll add, I'll add notes into that. Yeah. You know, so you have uh, the most recent information, I think. Right. So I, there, there is some dispute about whether Amazon uh, does allow affiliate links. Um, yeah. My understanding years ago is that, no, it was not allowed. And you actually could be um, flagged and have your, your listing removed if you included <laughs> affiliate links in the book. Um, their, their wording, at least as of the most recent information that I've encountered, is that you're not allowed to include something simply for, for the purpose of, of sales and um, advertise it on that basis. Um, but uh, some people have even posted screenshots of their, their conversations with KDP staff that says, hey, can I put an affiliate link in the book? Am I allowed to do that? Um, and the staff saying, you know, basically, yes, this is this is permitted. Um, in an abundance of caution, we say, no, don't do that. My recommendation instead would be if you if you have some affiliate links, if you have something that you uh, want to advertise and promote, uh, then send people over to your website, to your your research page. You know, I know that um, there are there are regulations or, or rules, at least as far as Amazon's concerned, about even including affiliate links in uh, in emails. Um, yeah. you, so uh, technically, they're they're giving you a chance to link over um, from a website, from something that you maintain uh, yourself or something that you participate on the, the World Wide Web, not on uh, on emails, which are uh, intended for private recipients and, and um, you know, not available publicly. So they, um, you know, they can flag that and flag your account and, and cause some um, uh, trouble potentially with your account in good standing. So um, send them over to your your own website. Um, you know, just a little resource page. Hey, here here are things that I like. Here are, um, uh, recommendations that I have, products that I that I enjoy, books that I um, that I can vouch for. Um, and this has a couple of benefits. The first benefit is um, you can update those those links on a rolling basis rather than having to update the the ebook file um, and then re-upload to Amazon and, and so forth. Um, number two. Uh, it allows you to capture user data, whether that's just general site traffic information or potentially email uh, addresses or that kind of thing, um, and bring them into your your sales funnel, your overall um, a business or website model. Um, uh, number three, you know, if there is a change in Amazon's policy later, even if it might technically be permitted um, right now, then you're hedging against that that future. Uh, change in policy. Uh, and then number four, you are required to have a disclosure statement if you have an affiliate link. And the disclosure statement can be something like, um, you know, uh, if you if you purchase something from this link or, or just be aware that these are affiliate links, if you purchase at no additional cost to you, I may be compensated. Um, you know, and then you might add something like, uh, but I only I make sure to only recommend things I actually believe in and and so on and so forth, just speaking to your own character and, and um, uh, how you operate your business, but um, but you are required to have a disclosure statement. You can't just have a uh, an affiliate link without uh, letting people know about it, and that's going to be a little bit easier to include on your own website rather than you know as a footnote in your uh, in the text of your your Amazon uh, Kindle ebook. Um, it's just going to be a little bit more seamless overall. So um, that would be the, the general recommendation. Uh, your thoughts, Jordan? I, I I totally agree. I think you know. Uh, yeah, and the more the, the cleaner you can keep it. I was nodding my head when you said the links thing because I've had broken links in my books before that had to go back in and and change those. I'm sure there are some that are even broken at this point. And the more you can make it clean, send people to one resource page on your website where you can say, hey, you know, even in your in in your book, you can say, hey, I have more resources. Uh, I have a, prog a program that I've heard. It's called this. I'd like to tell you more about it, or what, however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. Send people to your website, and then you can have that one resource page. I and mean, you could do it by book if you wanted to. 
Uh, right. But yeah, one resource page where you're giving your, you're saying your affiliates and then you're listing that out. Um, is it, It's gonna be the, the cleaner way to do it. You're gonna stay off Amazon's bad radar and the more that you can do that, the better. So yeah, just think about, think about keeping it clean and keeping it and easy because it's gonna be so much easier for yourself in the long run to update one page. Mm -hmm. uh, and the link to your resource page, if you keep it updated and, and going, it's not gonna break, so. Right, yep, great uh, great points. Uh, and I, yep. one more, sorry Rob, one, one more yeah. that, that sure. I want to forget to share is, that's good too, good practice too, for even whenever you're linking out in your book, even if it's not an affiliate link. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something I've personally gotten better at with some of my recent books, mm -hmm. not treating a book like a blog post and putting all these links in there mm -hmm. that may potentially break anyway. Yeah, the more you can just say, hey, uh, if you want additional information on this, you know, check out the resources page and you, you can lay it out however you want, but just keep it simple that way. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point. And, and that's something maybe I'll do uh, a video on at some point. It doesn't necessarily have to be a whole live, but just using uh, website redirects, you know, that, that are on your own website to, to help with some of that. So for example, you know, Jim, you asked earlier about editing um, and we have our hingelink.com slash editing, and that goes to a particular file. Uh, in some cases, we have other links that lead off to other websites, but um, uh, but if those ever change, then again, it's under my my own website. I can control it. So that because it's a redirect, um, you know, archangelink.com slash editing in this case, um, if that link breaks for some reason, um, I can have um, archangelink.com slash editing go to somewhere else, go, go to a new file uh, and um, without ever having to go back and change that um, that URL that people are actually plugging into. So um, yeah, and, and Jim mentions they are okay with Amazon links, uh, for example, fulfillment by, by Amazon. So great, yeah, that's, uh, that's good information, but um, uh, for, for the above reasons, it, it may be advantageous to, um, to use affiliate links in some sort of dedicated outside page. And um, you know, uh, the Amazon policy has, uh, has shifted a little bit, I think over time, and it could potentially shift again. So that's, that's our uh, abundance of caution recommendation. Um, okay, cool. Yep. And number 12, uh, the last of our bonus questions, uh, do I need legal clearance to mention products or services in my book? So this is a little bit related to the, yep. uh, the affiliate link question, but um, do you have anything you want to start off with or, or I can jump in again and you can add it? I mean, you. I'll let you answer it, but I mean, my gut common sense is for the most part, no. I mean, if you're, th if you're thinking about mentioning uh, you know, the fact that Facebook exists in your book and you're going to talk about it and you don't need to ask Mark Zuckerberg for permission to put that in your book. So thinking about things like that, um, I know as far as other, other questions, you, know, you definitely don't want to be doing anything questionable, mm -hmm. uh, but I guess more common sense things like that. But maybe I think that question is getting at a deeper, so I'll let you respond to it. Yeah. I, I, that, yeah. I think that the bigger, the bigger question, you know, and this is coming from, um, uh, from an author who has worked in, uh, I think, the education field or the public yeah. sector before. So there, there are more guidelines having to do with oh, yeah. their particular industry. Um, yeah, in general, no, you can you can definitely mention products and services. You can you can have opinions about them. You can say, hey, I really hate Facebook or I really <laughs> love Facebook or, you know, Twitter is terrible or Twitter is the best thing. Uh, though That's fine. You are permitted generally, um, at least in the United States, with uh, uh, the First Amendment. You do have freedom of expression, freedom of opinion. If something is an honestly held belief and and you are not uh, including factually inaccurate information, um, and, and particularly if you're dealing with, with public figures or public entities, uh, such as businesses, such as companies, um, you know, or even uh, celebrities or politicians or something like that, you are permitted to uh, to have opinion and to even be, um, you know, negative or critical. Um, it gets a little bit fuzzier if you say, "Hey, my neighbor, you know, Joe Smith uh, down the block at you know one two three Main Street um, is, I think, murdering murdering people." Um, well, you know, that's that, that could be. If that's not true, then then um, you know, you possibly have grounds for uh, for libel for legal action against you. Um, but um, but when you're dealing with with this kind of uh, with public entities um, with public figures, uh, you are permitted permitted to um, to have opinions to state them. Uh, again, I mean, if you if you have a business relationship with them, um, depending on the industry that you're in, you may be required to have certain disclosures. Uh, if you have an affiliate partnership um, with them, you are required to have a um, you know a disclosure to that effect. So um, you may be liable. Um, in that way, but but for the most part, no. You are you are absolutely okay to uh, to do that. You know, if you have 
if you have concerns, um, you know, maybe you're, you have a memoir and you're talking about previous experiences in your life, it may, it may be uh, to your advantage to fictionalize it, change uh, mm -hmm. names and identifying details. Um, you know, you might, might want to say, hey, my, uh, my classmate, Joe Smith, back when I was in second grade, was a big jerk and a big meanie. And, you know, he did A, B, and C, and, and that was terrible. Um, well, maybe don't, don't name Joe Smith. You know, maybe, maybe turn it into something else and don't mention, you know, that he grew up on that particular street that he grew up on or, or the town that you grew up in or, or what have you. Um, because potentially that could, that could cause some, uh, some trouble, especially if he is not a big jerk anymore. And, you know, he doesn't want to be associated with yeah. whatever, you know, the fact that he's nice guy now. <laughs> right, exactly. He used to kick sand at you at the beach. Um, you know, that's, that uh, doesn't, you know, may not be fair to him. So uh, in general, I think that's just good practice, um, obscure identifying, potentially identifying information um, for, for personal accounts, unless it's, you know, strictly necessary that you include it. But, um, but yeah, no, no trouble there. So that's, that's kind of what, uh, uh, what I would say about any of that. Anything else, Jordan? Yeah, it just makes me think on a practical sense. Yeah, the more you can just obscure that, you know, if, if you're ta telling a story about your boss, you know, just, just say your boss because mm -hmm. that, that could come across as meaning any of the bosses that you've had. So no, no one boss is going to be able to uh, make a big issue out of that. You know, said my boss so-and-so who lives at so-and-so, you know, and was my boss from this date and this day at this company. You know, just use what's necessary for the story. You probably don't need to... Uh, to say that, but yeah, for that stuff, use common sense when you're, uh, mm -hmm. you're just kind of trying to, yeah, keep it as uh, non-detailed as possible uh, in those, when you're telling those stories. Yep. Yeah. And then one other, one other angle that I thought of, um, don't make, again, don't make false claims. Don't make factually inaccurate information and don't, don't pretend to have the endorsement of something. Don't say, uh, you know, Coca-Cola endorses Archangel Inc. If they don't in fact endorse Archangel Inc. Don't, you know, the, something like that uh, can certainly, uh, cause some some legal troubles mm -hmm. for you. Um, it, it may it may actually not, you know, depending on on whether it matters to them, whether they decide to pursue action. I mean, I might be a crazy person shouting into the wind, and they might not care that that uh, I'm saying that Archangel Inc. is endorsed by Coca. -Cola. Yeah, sure, whatever, crazy person. I'm I'm going to ignore you. But um, you know, but something like that, obviously, um, if you are, uh, make sure that it is it is true. If you're going to make a claim like that, and um, you know, if you if you don't um, make a uh, an effort to to clear uh, that and get permission for for something like that, just know that yes, you could be um, exposing yourself uh, mm -hmm. to liability. But um, but again, generally not a big deal. Please feel free. You have uh, you have the right as an author to uh, to have opinions and to um, share your experiences, um, particularly about products and services and that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think. That the only other thing I would have with that, Rob, I know we're getting pretty late here, uh, but just want to add, you know, when you're when you're writing a book and when you're talking about other people and services, you know, just be just be aware and cognizant of the fact that you don't have to be there's you don't really want to be super negative. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that, um, but you don't want to give anyone a reason to, uh, you know, to, to come after your book or to say, hey, I, can't, I don't want to have that in there. You know, if you're thinking about like a small company or said uh, they, you know, they suck, they're terrible. I had such a terrible experience, never go to them. Um, you know, maybe, maybe all that experience is true, but do you really want that to be the focus uh, in your book or your blog post or anything like that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes, yeah, just, just think about that. You don't need, you don't need to have that negative attention in there. Even if it, even if you are perfectly able and free to say that, is it in your best interest to do so? Right. Yep. Yeah. In many cases, discretion and tact and, um, uh, you know, biting your tongue might be the better, better approach for, for all yeah. involved, not just from a, from a legal exposure standpoint, but just from, you know, a, um, uh, karma standpoint and, and presenting yourself, um, you know, uh, judiciously yeah. and graciously. Yeah. So yeah, great, great point. Uh, okay. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you, Jim and Dale for joining us and Christy as well. I will mention, uh, piggybacking on what Christy mentioned, if anybody is looking for a book co book cover, we have a promotion going on this week and we're happy to to chat a little bit. You can visit our uh, our page, our website, our Facebook page and, and learn some more details, see lots of examples of some of the book covers that we are uh, that we have done and we love doing book covers. They're a lot of fun and um, they're a really helpful tool for marketing your book and for getting your message out there. So um, we'd love to assist if you think that we might be a good fit for you. Definitely reach out and uh, and let us know. But aside from that, uh, I think we are we're all set. Did you have any closing thoughts, Jordan? 
Nope. All I wanted to say, Jim, is that it's uh, just about midnight here in Lisbon, too. It looks like we're on the same time frame. So okay. uh, good deal. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Really, really great to have you. Appreciate everybody tuning in. And folks, uh, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, join us next week. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, we will see you folks then. Have a good rest of your night.